have such sights to show you. Popping a scary horror podcast here. I'm your host Cole, and with me, as always, I have my good friend and co-host Aaron. Hello, hello, Aaron. It's been a spell or twelve. Yes, it's been a long journey. <laughs> oh my God! You're done. <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah. So you know exactly how uh, Dracula talks for today's episode. But of course, <laughs> if Dracula does not talk like this, then, then I'm leaving. <laughs> um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think you know it's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's okay. It's fine. Is this wait? Is this like a silent movie? This is an old ass movie, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. It was made in uh, 1931, but yeah. it is uh, it does have sound to it. It's oh, not okay. a silent film. No. In fact, it was. I believe. Uh, I mean, there's like the technicalities there, but mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it's one of Universal's first monster films. They did do other films like uh, Phantom of the Opera. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. Well, they actually did two versions of that, but that's getting into technicalities. But one of the first ones was the silent version, and then later on they would uh, redo it again. But this is like one of the big Universal monster biggies there. Yeah. Um, and you've actually seen this before, right? No. Oh, you really haven't. No, okay. I haven't seen Dragula. No. Yeah, but uh, oh, okay. Well, that that makes me feel better there a little bit there because I was like think I was like okay, yeah, yeah. I'm curious what he'll bring to the table there, but yeah. no, yeah. Uh, why don't you uh, talk about your experience with uh, Dracula? Because is I'm trying to think. This might be our first vampire film. You know? Oh, actually, no, I was wrong. I just realized Nosferatu. Yeah, yeah, I mean, technically, that's mm-hmm. that's the OG vampire, right? Mm-hmm. We've only watched really old-ass vampire movies. Yes. <laughs> no, nothing modern there, but... Right. Ah, man, yeah, 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 vampires are interesting, and Dracula's interesting, right? I mean, obviously, I don't know. I, I really don't know a whole lot about this movie, um, so much as I know a thing or two about dracula the character in popular fiction and and and, you know the bram stoker dracula novel Mm -hmm. um as how closely it follows the novel who knows because nosferatu as we know was um somewhat of an an adaptation of dracula Mm -hmm. so i don't i don't know yeah i don't know how closely this one's gonna be you know to the the source material or if it's like you know anything that's been around for so long and 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 you know inspired movies for so long that is going to be um you know sort of somebody's interpretation of dracula which is what mostly what we see today is you know i I think the biggest dracula thing in pop culture today is probably walking down the cereal aisle and picking up some count chocula you know what i mean Mm -hmm. so he's just one of those figures that's like yeah dracula everybody knows dracula's for kids and stuff so i'm interested to see if this is an interesting, scary monster. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I- I'll definitely be curious to see um, what you think because I know that you uh, really liked Nosferatu a yeah, lot yeah. and what it brought to the table. So I'm curious what this one will do for you, especially mm-hmm. since um, it's aptly named after Bram Stoker's uh, novel Dracula. Mm-hmm. There. So I'll be very curious to see what you think about it. Um, whenever it comes to me and my experience with uh, Dracula, um, like many of the other kind of horror films, uh, James Rolfe uh, would talk about the Universal Monster films. Mm-hmm. And uh, this is kind of an uh, interesting story because what had happened is once I had learned about it, um, it was like maybe a couple of years later where I was going garage selling with my mom and at one of the garage sales, I saw they had a couple of video cassette tapes and it's like the, um, Oh, I can actually break this out here. For you. Yeah. Wow. I, I know. Right. It just happens to be in front of me. And I'm like, Oh, what the hey, Let me break it out. So yeah. these are the two video cassette tapes I had gotten from the garage sale. And so one of them was Dracula and the other one was Frankenstein. <laughs> and I still had my uh, same VCR hooked up, the, the exact same one I recorded Halloween 2 on whenever mm-hmm. it was airing on the AMC channel. Mm-hmm. But I picked these up and I was like, okay, awesome. I'm going to go ahead and uh, 
revisit these films and as you can tell by the condition they were part of like this uh universal monster classic collection where i think you would like pay money and they would mail one to you every month there oh. they have a huge giant collection but i saw these two and i thought they looked awesome even though they weren't like dvds i already had a dvd player mm -hmm. uh but i was like yeah i'll definitely check it out and um that's pretty much how i was able to watch uh both dracula and frankenstein there I'm gonna go ahead and put these bad boys back up yeah but um yeah so that was pretty much my exposure to uh dracula and i won't give in to my thoughts about it or anything but it's definitely a film for me um i've seen it a couple of times and each time i rewatch it there's something else i notice about it oh. so yeah de definitely uh stay tuned to figure out my thoughts on that but i mean i'm, I'm kind of the same thing as you you know obviously dracula is like a big pop culture icon there mm -hmm. to where again you've seen it you know parody as count chocula and even the voice of dracula um bella lugosi doing his voice there it pretty much mm -hmm. made it the standard vampire voice that many <laughs> people would imitate i mean you even yeah. you even know it and you've never seen the movie because right. you've heard other people do just, it just so much parody and yeah yeah that, that includes dracula and the count on sesame street for yes. god's sake i mean he's everywhere <laughs> but i've never yeah i've never actually seen a core Dracula movie. I never even read Bram Stoker's Dracula, though I think I know a couple fun facts about oh, it. Oh, really? I'm yeah. surprised you hadn't. I, no, I figured I, you... I, I I was, like, prepared to be like, okay, you know, you're gonna be like, well, in the book. <laughs> <it's mushy."> right. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, yeah, no. I've, I've never read Frankenstein either, so we get to that. Yeah. And, you know, but I'm pretty... Are, were they... Am I just tripping, or were, were they both written at the same time? Uh, they were both fairly written close. I know that Mary Shelley wrote mm -hmm. it in like 18 something both aaron and i are looking it up uh let's see yeah frankenstein was written in 1816 Eight. and then dracula was written in uh 1897 okay no never mind oh wow oh, well, it was this 1897 though okay never mind I knew they were both 1800s, but for some reason I thought they were written during the same kind of period. Yeah, Cause... which is surprising mm -hmm. to think, because again, um, at least in my mind, I always view Dracula as an older tale right. than I do Frankenstein. So It definitely has that mm. element of old legend. Cause he's in a castle in Transylvania mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, it's like, you know, it's, it's got all these elements of, of old timey. Yeah. Um, and, and perhaps it's even set before it's written, but... Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'll, I'll be very curious to see how it's uh, kind of broken down there. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely ready to uh, yeah. dig into this film. Dying so um, don't go anywhere. We will be right back <laughs> <laughs> whenever we watch Dracula. <laughs> <laughs> I hate myself. <laughs> And we are back from watching Dracula. Yes, <laughs> I want to suck your wiener. I mean, <laughs> we didn't watch that version of uh, Dracula. <laughs> <Jackula. laughs> um, no, well, we came back from watching uh, Dracula, and uh -huh. uh, Aaron, oh. what are your thoughts, matey? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, you know, Dracula the movie. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's a lot less of ha 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 and a lot more just intense staring. Um, yes. You know? <laughs> it was dramatically lit staring. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that was good. That was a, that was an experience. Mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely agree. And uh, like I mentioned before, I once again noticed uh, a lot of things in this uh, uh, watch through that I hadn't noticed the previous times I had mm -hmm. seen it. Unfortunately, I wanted to watch it on 4K, but I mm -hmm. guess my 4K player or the disc itself wasn't working to be determined. But we were able to watch the Blu-ray version, which is still fairly cleaned up because uh, I'm not sure how used you you are to watching older films but usually they have like that what the best thing i could call it is like that blurry vaseline kind of glaze oh, to the films yeah, there yeah. because that's just the quality they were able to produce at the time mm -hmm. so definitely was cleaned up so that way i could pick up on some of the smaller tinier details there mm -hmm. but um yeah no <clears throat> pretty much uh i'm along the same lines as you just saying like 
yep it's dracula pretty good there yeah. um so i'll dive into the plot there while you finish up your twix uh -huh. there <laughs> Um, so basically the plot of Dracula focuses on this guy named Renfield who is a real estate agent and so he's going over to uh, Count Dracula's castle to help him out but it's quickly foreshadowed once he announces that he's going over there to meet up with them uh, all of the t local townsfolk is like Mm, I don't know if you want to do that. That seems mm -hmm. like a bad idea. We've heard nothing but bad things about them. They say vampires mm -hmm. roam the castle grounds. And so it's pretty much um, from Rinfield's point of view that he meets Dracula. And then afterwards, we're introduced to another group of characters that coincides with Rinfield's story mm -hmm. and what's going on. So uh, plot-wise, I do like how it kind of sets it up one way just to kind of get establishing um establishing grounds whenever it comes to characterizing dracula mm -hmm. um and we'll talk about this more in uh detail but uh i would probably argue that both the actor who plays uh renfield uh and dracula are the strongest performances Oh yeah, I, I would yeah. say uh, the whole film there, which uh, Renfield was played by Dwight Fry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, plot wise, I really like the way it sets it up because we get that like classic, you know, castle of Dracula yeah. there. So we get like those establishing spooky shots there that we always associate whenever we think of uh, Dracula there. So mm -hmm. I really like that. And then how it ties into the plot to kind of help tell a bigger story there. Right. Um, and again, while I do like it, uh, I think uh, and this might be more so of the pacing, but that's kind of the more of the bigger issue I have whenever it comes to plot is the pacing it takes there. Mm -hmm. It definitely takes its sweet time there. And while I don't mind it, it's definitely something I'm like, Okay. Yeah, it's definitely has the characteristics a lot of old movies have where they, they tend to hang on to shots a little longer or just like, say, this happened, and then it's a still shot of that thing that happened for like five seconds, and mm -hmm. then it goes back, and all those little editing choices just like make the mm -hmm. movie seem so much slower in comparison to, to modern movies. Yeah, and I think there's definitely like a lot in the editing department there that mm -hmm. definitely makes kind of the pacing seem even slower, which again, mm -hmm. it's not a problem per se. It's just like something I'm just like, okay, you know, because right. we're just like sitting there and then the movie is silent right? <laughs> as it's focusing on the shots there. And so that's, that's one of the things that surprised mm -hmm. me too is, yeah, it... it there was like no music throughout mm -hmm. the entire film, which yeah. like it opens with like that cool ass banger of a thing. Oh, it's so good. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be dope. It's Dracula time. And then just no music. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are often like one, two minute parts where there's just no sound at all. No sound effects or anything. But... Yeah. Which is weird. Mm -hmm. Um, and we, we might as well talk about it since we're talking about it now, but that's kind of one of the weird places I'm at with this movie. Cause whenever I think of Dracula, I think of that hissing noise that again mm -hmm. you notice with older films is like the tss, like the hiss that you hear with mm -hmm. that and so I always associate that with this film because yeah. there's really only music right at the beginning mm -hmm. and that's it there is not really any other music unless they go to an opera mm -hmm. there so that's one of the things that I'm not sure how to feel about I think like if I was seeing it for the first time I wish there would be more music but because yeah. i've grown so accustomed to seeing it multiple times and i just don't expect music it ends up not bothering me as yeah. bad but it's definitely noticeable and i'm just like yep more hissing yeah more <laughs> just, more hissing there just white noise it, it, it's just a weird thing because like on the one hand like i think i would love to have more music especially with mm -hmm. that beautiful score they have at the beginning yeah, like it just yeah. absolutely nails the mood and everything and it just kind of is a little disappointing not to see what else they could have come up with. Because they definitely could have raised the intensity of some of the scenes there mm -hmm. with uh, the music. Um, Which is funny because I feel like I compare this a lot to Nosferatu. Because obviously mm -hmm. same kind of inspired plot. Same mm -hmm. uh, almost age of movie. And Nosferatu was obviously a silent film. But it was 
all music, you know what I mean? So, mm-hmm. And they were doing a lot with the music. The music was carrying a lot of the mood, and I kind of missed that in this one. But... Yeah, which is so funny, because that film came out in 1922, right. so this film came out nine years afterwards, mm-hmm. and so I, I know it's like, obviously the music wasn't a part of the film back in the day. They would have like a live accompanist playing there, but the music definitely helped elevate Nosferatu Mm -hmm. for me as well. So I'm in total agreement with you there. And so that'll be kind of interesting because, you know, technically both of them are adaptations of Bram Stoker's Dracula, Mm -hmm. but both doesn't follow it to a T right there. They do kind of like their own individual things. Even at the beginning of the movie, it says like, you know, based on Bram Stoker's Dracula, the stage play, mm-hmm. which was an adaptation of that. So right. it's kind of like the game telephone where you keep changing mm-hmm. stuff down the line. But um, I feel like still, even though the plot is different from both the book and Nosferatu, I mm-hmm. still feel like it's a serviceable plot. Yeah, yeah. It's, you know? it's, it's a lot. Yeah, it's definitely more interesting from someone who just fairly recently watched Nosferatu to watch this one and it not be... I mean, the paths diverge pretty quickly as mm-hmm. to the cast of characters and the, um, you know, what, what the central motivation is going on. There's yeah. Some... Yeah, absolutely. And since we've already talked about it, uh, why don't we talk about the main man who the whole film is named after, yeah. uh, Count Dracula played by Bella Lugosi. So, mm-hmm. with all this hype up to see kind of one of the original representations of Dracula... Uh, what do you think of Bella's performance? Oh, I mean, I, I could, I can see why it's iconic. I can see why he's really sort of the image of Dracula to come. You know what I mean? Every every uh, depiction of Dracula looks a lot like him, and I imagine mm-hmm. he's the first like big on screen depiction of mm-hmm. actual Count Dracula. Um, so yeah, he's he's suave, he's handsome, he's but he's he's strange too. And the characters in the film do a good job of acknowledging both mm-hmm. of those things, where he can be sort of mesmerizing and transfixing, and you know, a lot of that's because he's a big vampire guy. Um, but then also, you know, he's like, all right, this weird guy from Transylvania is talking about <laughs> death and shit. Yeah. Like, okay, buddy, you know. <laughs> Um, I, I'm in total agreement with you. It, it's so weird whenever it comes to uh, Bella's performance because I love it a ton, mm-hmm. but I'm not quite as ecstatic as other people are when they talk about it. But I understand right. why they are at mm-hmm. the same time. So it's definitely like no diss of like, oh, it's overrated there. Right. But like, because again, obviously like the silly voices we did, that just comes from people doing, uh, in, you know, just uh characterizations of it there mm-hmm. but if you actually watch his performance it's way more subtle with right. his uh accent he speaks with but he you could tell he's having a lot of fun in this role there and mm-hmm. just eating up every scene but there is a lot of weird choices where it's like if he's not like talking he's very rigid yeah he's about to say he's very stiff unless he's in moments where he and then and then he kind of explodes you know what i mean mm-hmm um, and there is a lot of staring, which I think he does a really good job, but mm-hmm. it's one of those tricks that I think that they overuse yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah it's um, a lot. And it, it, I started to like sort of waver on what exactly it meant every time they were looking at him staring. Like, because I thought at the beginning, I was like, is this when he's like casting his charming spells? They go to this dramatic lighting, him staring, but. And then I was like, no, I don't think that's what he's doing every mm-hmm. time. I think they're just looking at him. <laughs> they're just doing this close-up shot of Dracula just over and over and over. Yeah, because there is sometimes where he is kind of like hypnotizing, mesmerizing people. Mm-hmm. But then there's a lot of points where nothing's going on. But I think what it is is that they're trying to just highlight just how intense his eyes are 24-7. Mm-hmm. It's either that or they're just like, just like, we need something to fill the space. Right. Let's put this here. Because they do cut right. away a lot because mm-hmm. I'm sure at the time there's a lot of things they're doing in this movie that was not uh, that would be considered a uh, taboo mm-hmm. uh, because anytime he steps out of the coffin you never see him step out it cuts away and then pans right back mm-hmm. uh, so I imagine that just must I, I if I remember correctly I could be totally wrong but it's like at the time this was seen as macabre seeing people crawl out of coffins there mm, so they I cut away it. and then every time spoiler alert he uh, bites someone's neck mm-hmm. they cut away immediately mm-hmm. they don't even show the bite marks mm, yeah uh, so I feel like 
that must have shaved off a lot of time there where then they're just like okay what do we do surprised me because they they show like a little bit of blood at the beginning when he cuts Mm -hmm. his finger you know and i was like i was like oh okay but then yeah nothing else after that yeah which is so weird uh if yeah i think it might have been one of those things that they that was as much blood as they could show at the time you know it's just like films that's pretty much how we are where we are today the people that would just cross that threshold just Mm -hmm, a little bit there mm -hmm. and kind of expand it um but yeah whenever it comes to his eyes i do i do think he has a marvelous like gaze Mm -hmm. like you know just very intense stare it's just the fact that they show it so repeatedly that i feel like the effectiveness is worn down just a teensy bit not a lot just a teensy bit but I especially love that they like cast light over his eyes to really emphasize, mm-hmm. you know, just how mesmerizing and intense they are. Because that's the whole thing about Dracula. He like is very seductive and alluring mm-hmm. to individuals to kind of draw them in. They even make a joke at the beginning about like, you know, the spider weaving webs to mm-hmm. capture flies there whenever he's talking to Renfield. So. And, and it goes over Renfield's head. He's just like, uh, yeah. And he's yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, sure. Trying to get rid of the spider web as yeah. he walks through it. Yeah, he definitely uh, committed a real estate agent to say the very least yeah. there, which uh, we might as well talk about Renfield, who yeah. it's like one of those things that I respect Bella's performance and I still love his performance, but I think Renfield is like on a technical aspect leagues above yeah, the I'd, rest. I'd agree, you know. Mm-hmm. You're not necessarily really rooting for Renfield at any point, but like he's he has to do such a dramatic character change, like as an actor, mm-hmm. going from where he is at the beginning to where he is at the end of the story. That is, um, yeah, it's it's impressive from an acting standpoint, mm-hmm. especially to have something. He has some fairly nuanced parts. There's a lot of overacted parts too, but mm-hmm. that's just how acting was done at the time. But yes. you know, um, the, just the level of nuance he did have with some of his character choices is you know, it stands the test of time. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, because um, that's definitely a lot of the characteristics of these older films. You will have characters that are just over the top mm-hmm. there. But I feel like whenever it came to Renfield, whenever he made the deliberate choices to go over the top, he would have a lot of, again, nuances mm-hmm. and very, very small moments and... He had a really difficult role, I believe, and yeah. that's obviously no disrespect to Bella and his performance. Like I said, it, it's it's a standout performance there mm-hmm. that stapled him as a horror icon. It's just, I feel like Renfield is definitely kind of the MVP for me, mm-hmm. because um, every scene I saw him in, um, I just couldn't look away yeah. for the most part, especially once he has to make that character change. Because mm-hmm. he's... He does a really good job at the beginning, just kind of being just a straight man, you know, kind of like, oh, well, that's oh, weird, you know. I'm oblivious to everything. Let's yes. Go to the spooky castle. Yeah, <laughs> just pretty much is like, yeah, let's just go here. This is this is perfectly fine. Just doing business. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to ignore all the weird stuff that's been going on because I need to make the sale. Right. Top of the morning to you. Sign the contract. Please. Yes. Um, so I have... N- like the utmost admiration Mm -hmm. for the performance that uh dwight did as renfield and so again he's the joker baby by the end (laughs) (laughs) no and it's just like again like because he changes both he performs with both his voice and his body language Mm -hmm. there and yeah there's like a part at the end where he's like literally crawling on the floor like a monster oh my gosh that was such smooth movement mm. there so um i that, i just have to give a just a big nod to him just because i'm like he gets better every single time i see it mm-hmm. and bella always stays at that consistent really good mm-hmm. really really good makes it enjoyable uh whenever it comes to the rest of the characters i would probably argue the one that's able to have the next most amount of fun is uh van helsing uh played by edward van sloan um i just i i love his aesthetic there just like like (laughs) the short buzz cut Mm -hmm. there and the glasses thick glasses and yeah Mm -hmm. this nice tailored suit and I'm a yeah. genius. I have deduced that you're a vampire. <laughs> yeah, he does the part really well, but it's also at the point that I I feel like um, he gives it a stand-up performance, and he does a lot of stuff that's fun and enjoyable there. Mm-hmm. But I think like if I was being like on a technical note, I think he is a little more by the numbers as opposed to Bella and Dwight, who kind of explain 
exploded with their roles. Van Helsing is a really good Van Helsing there, yeah. uh, but I also feel like he's a little bit dry, just a tiny bit mm -hmm. there. But it's nothing too bad. I still enjoy watching him every single time, and he has a he has a a lot of good uh, play of the game moments. Yeah, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> yeah. He definitely has a couple things. Yeah, he's got tricks up his sleeve. And I feel like he does have, like, a dash of ham. You know, he hams yes, it up, like, a exactly. little bit. exactly. But he, he never goes, like, all out. Which, mm. yeah, especially when you contrast it to some of the other performances of the time. Yeah. Yeah, you can, you can seem a little dry. Yeah, which, again, this is, like, no, like, major diss at him. I still love his performance. Mm -hmm. A lot more people are critical of it mm -hmm. there um, when comparing to the other ones. For me, I think he's a perfect fit uh a perfect foil that is to dracula mm, yeah whenever yeah. it comes to that but there is a lot of moments that i'm just like he he's a little uh less defined a bit and kind of ends up kind of being like filler role like oh exposition man yeah yeah he's like oh he, moving the story along yes exactly which isn't a problem but at the same point it definitely becomes like Okay, yeah, because, like, he has to explain a lot of the rules, because especially this is, like, one of the first vampire films, so right. a lot of the general audiences aren't used to it, as opposed to, like, current pop culture. Like, you can ask anybody on the street, and they know some of the rules of the vampires. Obviously, right. it varies from genre to genre, sure. but they yeah. know kind of basics there, you know, turns into a bat, you mm -hmm. know. Don't go in the sun. Yeah, doing all that stuff. Um, but I feel like, again... Um, like I mentioned, I love his design. I love uh, some of the moments he has there. Um, I just felt like he could have been a teensy bit better. Like, it's almost close to being 100 mm -hmm. there. It's like if, uh, you know, I'm ranking it, it's like uh, A plus for Renfield, A for Lugosi, and then A minus for Van Helsing. Yeah, I'd yeah. agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like they're both A's and like, definitely top of the line there, but... Just, that's how I would rank it, anyhow. Right. Um, you have a little dash of, of finesse, you know yeah. what I mean? And uh, to go over the rest of the characters, because they do kind of fall in importance yeah, after those yeah, three. Because That's true. Those are the big three. <laughs> yeah, the big three. Uh, we do have uh, the uh, damsel in distress, basically, Mina, mm -hmm. yes. there, which I feel like she does a pretty good job there. Right. She, she doesn't really define find her character too much so you don't really get to know who she is there mm -hmm. but again she kind of is going through this troubling time there but she does have to make a couple of uh acting choices there due mm -hmm. to her character's conflicts that does change her performance a bit so mm -hmm. i did enjoy seeing that and i did feel like she did a fairly decent job of doing it right uh, again i just feel like it just could have been fine-tuned better but i think it's also because of the writing they probably didn't give her a lot to work yeah, with yeah yeah in the 30s i'm sure they were like woman you're in distress okay that's that's all you need yeah <laughs> exactly so uh, no diss to a uh, helen uh, chandler who played mina but yeah. and overall there's, there's a yeah. couple parts especially mm -hmm. towards the end where yeah she has yeah. to make some interesting acting choices and i yeah i would agree i think she does shine in the little moments where she can it's just there's not very many of those that they yeah. allowed to her. I, I think the person that suffered the absolute worst when it came to the writing department was her uh, partner boyfriend, uh, John <laughs> Harker, played by David Manners. John. Again, probably no disrespect. He's just a straight man. Mm -hmm. That's all he's given. <laughs> yeah, he's kind of... Yeah, he's kind of dumb, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he just, he's just kind of like, now wait a second here. You mean to tell me there's a vampire? Vampires? Those are things of myths and legends. Yeah. Anyway, it... let me go find my girlfriend that has two holes in her neck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely kind of like, it's hard to know whether it's just uh, the actor's kind of fault and making it fairly dry. I think it's uh, both, definitely mm -hmm. both for that situation. Like, I'm sure the writing was like, you know, we need to have the, like, doubter, the one that's inquisitive. Like, I don't understand. What's going on? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, Van Helsing is exposition man kind of coming in. Right. So um, I think whenever it comes to, like, the uh, art of Dracula there, you see a lot more of the bone structure of what's moving the parts there. Um, so, again, don't have a big problem with it. It's just he's kind of there, mm -hmm. and that's how I feel about, you know dr seward played by herbert bunston who is the father of mina mm -hmm. again i feel like he's also kind of like the one that's supposed to uh 
rocked the exposition there and just be like, what's going on around here? Right. You know, I, I will not have this in my establishment there. Right. In my household full of loonies. Yes, yeah, and that's exactly it. And honestly, that's kind of how I feel about everybody else. There wasn't really, like, a performance that was, like, so bad or stand out no. but there was like actors where sometimes they would have like a goofy face <laughs> there that was hard whether it was like one of the workers at the sanatorium i know that um just to give a uh, major shout out uh you really liked uh martin who was like w- the guard for yeah. renfield and he's like, like the muscle kind of guy yeah he, yeah charles k gerard <laughs> He was funny. Yeah, he he had a couple of zinger moments there. Um, so he was kind of like good comedic relief, I would say. Mm-hmm. There, yeah, there's a moment where he's like with the maid, and he's like, <laughs> and he they they shout some order at him, and he's like, "All right," and he's and he just looks at her, and he's like, "Everyone here's loony except for you and me." <laughs> and sometimes I wonder about you, and she just goes, "Yes," and, <laughs> and then he starts to like back away slowly. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's like it's, he's given a small slice, but he makes the most out of it, I would yeah, say. Because, yeah. um, again, it's hard whenever you're given a small role to be like, okay, right. go. And then some people just, you know, go A to B, and then other people are able to elevate it there. So I have to give uh, major kudos to his performance there for making it fun. Right. But, I mean, aside from that, um, I know there's lucy who is the friend of mina and you get to Mm -hmm. see her for a little bit and i feel like it's fine the only thing i have a problem with is we her character arc is just kind of thrown to the wind you hear like you know oh yeah we last heard of her doing this yeah there that's kind of like in the middle of our movie is where she kind of like dips out and there's just so much confusion in that part of the movie i feel for as for as being grounded as like because mm-hmm. we spend so much of most of the, of the second half of the movie at that house where Mina lives and the, the mm-hmm. and they're all, like despite that being most of the scenes it's like a lot of those little characters are just like in and out and in and out and you don't know where they are or where they're going mm-hmm. or whatever and it's it's there's not a lot of being grounded i feel like but yeah people are very much free moving like mm-hmm. moving through there and that's kind of like the one of the things that makes it very kind of interesting is like the fact that whenever van helsing quickly realizes that uh dracula Mm -hmm. is uh, a vampire because you figure it out very early in the film right and i only mention that because everyone yeah i i I would be very surprised if they didn't know that dracula was a vampire film right um but even then they just kind of let they don't say like oh wait we need to keep them out there mm-hmm. you know like they do some stuff but you just see them freely roaming through yeah and they, they, their mm-hmm. efforts to keep dracula out are very pity he's just, <laughs> he's just kind of like walks into the windows and stuff it's like what's up <laughs> yeah yeah definitely um kind of interesting which i know they do that so they can keep the plot moving forward but it is definitely again kind of more rigid with stuff and i i love that with renfield constantly escaping to add more like insight at to dracula yeah, and yeah. what's going on that they kind of make a joke like how the heck does he keep getting out yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's always in and out and you know honestly all mm-hmm. the in and out of these characters like coming into this one central mm-hmm. living room over and over it does it really does feel like it was adapted from the, the play you mm-hmm. know what i mean because it's like there's like a couple scenes that they keep going back and forth it's like the middle of the living room and like mm-hmm. mina's bedroom and like those are the two places you are for like like a very large chunk mm-hmm. it's like here's acts two and three or whatever it's just these two places and it's you know dracula coming in the window and hey and yeah and the characters just sort of like arrive do their bit walk off and like that's why yeah despite it it having one grounded scene like it feels really discombobulated mm-hmm. at times no for sure i i would definitely agree with that um yeah and that's that's kind of the interesting thing with dracula that i've noticed is that again we've kind of mentioned this but there is a lot of like technical aspects to this film that does end up feeling like they didn't know what to do or wrap up because mm-hmm. there's plot points they just forget about there's even like one moment where like renfield is crawling towards somebody Mm -hmm. and you never know what happens it's true because then you see like the like person she he was crawling towards just in the next scene perfectly fine (laughs) so it's just like a lot of kind of 
weird notes and takes and i think that also kind of falls into the special effects even where Mm -hmm. i feel like um nosferatu had a lot more impressive effects Mm -hmm. nine years before this film did right so i think that's just kind of a weird thing and again like it's not like nosferatu was like groundbreaking with its effects but i feel like more effects were deployed in that than in this film because again whenever you do see like um again kind of like vampire bats or bats flying around it's clearly bats on string which yeah isn't too distracting but they rely on it so much as if they were like this is the top tier mm-hmm. of yes. technology yes and they also never bother to do anything except for like dracula walks off screen and then bat and then the bat flies off screen and then dracula mm-hmm. walks. like they, they never even attempted to show a transition or anything you know what i mean between mm-hmm. between their forms yeah, it it was definitely kind of like one of those things that it doesn't hurt the film, but it definitely does kind of draw you out of it a bit. And it yeah, kind yeah. of, again, adds to the pacing and makes it long. Because, again, right. they focus on those bats for a long freaking time. They do. And, and, it just, and it also goes to show in the places where they're not using special effects becomes really obvious, where they're just, like, yelling at things off screen. You know what I mean? <laughs> they do that a lot. They're like, there's a big dog out there oh you mean a wolf and they're like talking about this wolf, but they don't it's just like some guy pointing off screen you know what i mean mm-hmm. like and the wolves are pretty central to the, to, to the story and the atmosphere there's a lot of wolf howling mm-hmm. and, and like that's part of the communication but uh you never see one <laughs> yeah they were also very sparse on the like sound effects there because yeah, oh, yeah. you would hear sometimes the you would hear the wolves sometimes in the background there but again whenever it came to like what's that Mm-hmm. I, it's like a big dog running across the field right. and it's just like could you not have added a howl or something to there some, or some trotting noises of bats. a dog running or something because again with the lack of music there's just a lot of quiet moments yeah. there which again isn't awful but it definitely does detract from the film especially in moments where you know maybe dracula's sneaking off and doing something sneaky and it's showing everything to you which is great mm-hmm. show don't tell but there's also no noise whatsoever. There's no. I would. I would have loved some little spooky music over that, or just you know the sound of a flap, flap, flap with the bat yes. wing, and then a landing, and then you know even just a a quick you know musical note when he sucks somebody's blood or something. You mm-hmm. know, just just something. But there's a lot of just like I'm approaching the neck for like thirty seconds, and then it cuts away right before he gives it a, mm-hmm. a scrape and lick. You know. What I mean? Yes. No. I I would totally agree. And again, if it wasn't for the fact that other films before this, uh, not Nosferatu, but like just other films, like even talk about like how to make the most out of a soundtrack there you Mm -hmm. take like steamboat willie there and like that was just cater to sound effects to show off there and that was in 1928 so it's like three years prior there which again Mm -hmm. i don't think you have to like make as much noise as that does because again it's like a cartoon and again that's like seven minutes long versus a whole stankin movie but like give us more like um, help us get immersed more into it there Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, as is, it's still fine. It's just like one of those things like this could be elevated like even further oh, yeah. there. So I think like definitely, uh, time hasn't been the most kind to it, but mm-hmm. it's also, again, still really enjoyable to watch and never threw me off entirely to where I'm like, okay, okay, right. I'm, 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 I'm out. I'm out of this movie. Yeah. It definitely holds your attention for the most part. It's just not, yeah, it's not as captivating as it could be. Cause I feel like with the material and really with mm-hmm. a lot of the performances, yeah, you could yeah. just be sucked in, but it's lacking that, you know, yeah. any sort of sound design, which I, you know, I, I know it's the thirties, but still, as we talked about with other movies, they have the technology, they've been doing it on other movies mm-hmm. at the time and they just weren't, weren't doing it here. Yeah, I, I would totally agree. Because, again, the most times I am captivated is whenever you get to see some of the performances really shine out. Again, like we've mentioned, you know, mm-hmm. Bella has some good moments. Renfield has a lot of good moments. Mm-hmm. And then Van Helsing has uh, quite a few uh, poggers moments yeah. there. Play of the yes. game. Um, and um, th- I'm sure we could talk more about it in spoilers there. Uh, but was there any other points you wanted to hit on before reaching that area? Um, hmm, I 
don't think so. I mean, I've yeah. got just little specific details where I'm like, oh, I really like this. Or, yeah. Oh, I like that. That's but kind I, of where I'm yeah, at, too. I'm not sure what would be a spoiler and what wasn't. So we might as well just hop over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Aaron, please give the audience the lovely uh, hearing of your rating of mm-hmm. Dracula. Yeah, I mean, Dracula's a mood, man. It's a good, good fall time flick, Halloween time flick, classic monster movie. I love that we're, we're diving into the, the universal monsters now um, with this introduction into Dracula. Um, but, yeah, there's some things that I could count off. You can say it's the, the test of time, um, or, or I would argue, I mean, a lot of the stuff that I'm counting Dracula off for is stuff that they could have done in the 30s. I'm like, I'm giving it the benefit mm-hmm. of the doubt, but yeah, those the long periods with no noise whatsoever that happened multiple times. You know, it's not just an artistic choice; it's just they didn't fill that with anything. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, a, a couple of stale performances. You know, a lot of. Um, uh, shortcuts that are still visible, I think, to this mm-hmm. day to get this movie made, um, kind of, kind of put a damper on what would otherwise be a, a very captivating and timeless tale from Mr. Bram Stoker. So, mm-hmm. um, I liked it. It was good. I think overall, I would give it probably about like a six point five. Okay. Um, yeah, it still has a lot of charm, and um, for for any movie to still be relevant and interesting and captivating you know almost 100 years later is they gotta be doing something right and this this does several things right it's just yeah there's a few things where you know if you're if you're maybe uh maybe didn't get much sleep the night before i probably wouldn't put this one on because yeah. you, you might fall asleep halfway through kind of thing but if, i mean if you're looking for an old movie yeah yeah dracula's a well it's a classic yeah, no, I, I, I'm I pretty much on the same line of thinking as you are, because like I was sitting there thinking like, OK, where am I going to rate this? Because, again, there are like, again, um, it comes to like my enjoyment versus like my critical thinking of a film there. Mm-hmm. And I, while I do just care more if I enjoy the film rather than if it's like technically a sound film, mm-hmm. um, it's one of those things that I was struggling with back and forth. And so, rating wise, I would probably rate it at a lowly seven. Seven. Um, I can't go higher than that. Uh, but at the same point, I think there is a little more meat on the bone there that this is like my third or fourth time watching it. And I still enjoy it, even though it does, again, <laughs> that hissing. It's like I both love it, but also get tired of it mm-hmm. there. It's just kind of like, you know. It's like, oh yeah, this is classic, you know, Dracula here and that's yeah. But also at the same point, I'm like, okay, let's just move it along. And again, when they're comparing it to the other Universal films there, mm-hmm. especially one that's my absolute favorite, it's it's hard for it to compete there, especially because you like you mentioned, I feel like whenever it comes to this film, there's a lot of beautiful artistic moments mm-hmm. there, uh, but there's also a lot of bare bones moments where I literally just see like you know, okay, this is the purpose of this scene right. going through there. And again, the, some of the performances do kind of fall flat towards the end, especially as they're mm-hmm. just trying to reach the ending of the film. So that's where I'd be at. But still, nothing but mad respect for Dracula. I still consider it a classic universal monster pick. And if you have any remote interest in vampires, I think you'll like it a lot. Yeah. You know, even if it is like you know, over 90 years old, it still has a lot of good moments there. And again, establishes that spooky atmosphere that the Universal Monsters are known for. So definitely, definitely give it a watch if you have access to it. Okay, so spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. How about you talk about the first spoiler you want to talk about, Aaron? Uh, Okay, this one's nothing crazy, but I just want to talk about the set pieces. like Yes. Because I think that's one of the things this film does really well, Mm -hmm. is all the different sets. Uh, I was really in the mood, not just with the fucking, with with the opening score, but whenever they go in, they show that little dinky uh, tavern, you know, outside of Dracula's castle, and they show the rocky sort of outcrop, mm-hmm. which is obviously like a painting. But this is one example where they did really good special effects, yes. is where they're like mm-hmm. riding into the castle, and it looks like they're they're riding along the path, but it's it's obviously like a painted set piece of this Dracula's castle. And then you go inside the castle, yeah. and it's you know the the monster staircase and this, the decrepit things, even the little possums and stuff. And they're yeah. like, <laughs> 
crawling behind the, <laughs> the coffins and armadillos skitter around and you know it's uh it's just it's a mood it's like yeah mm-hmm. it's dracula no, they did it i think they just did a fantastic job with the sets and the environments it really just started to slow down once you hit about the middle of the movie mm-hmm. after they do and there's that great like the ship scene where they're going over to london and it's you know storming and the sailors are getting washed about side mm-hmm. to side and red feels like master <laughs> you know <laughs> night time comes master you know and mm. he's like whispering to him in the coffin it's like i was like ah oh, yeah it's awesome mm. it just really starts to get stale yeah once they get into that house that's mm. like also the psych ward is it like the same yeah it's yeah. a house inside of a sanitarium yeah they're living quarters right and so like once we get there i mean it's obviously interesting in the beginning but you just sit there for so long and it's mm-hmm. just like this people's living room and it's just so much exposition it really starts to clunk down until you finally at the end get to broach into the abbey that um the count dracula is now inhabiting mm-hmm. and going underneath and all the you know the, the buttresses of the church or whatever underneath you see those arches mm-hmm. and like the catacombs and like that was that was dope it's just there's that big lull in the middle where it kind of dips and you're waiting to between those scenes to get bridged but yeah no, I, I'm I'm in total agreement. In fact, whenever we, were, I was like, yeah, let's talk about spoilers. I was like, man, I wish I would have talked about setting beforehand. Yeah. But like I said, for the most part, um, I'm in total agreement with you. And I feel like again, the castle uh, that he has at the beginning and the abbey which he resides in at the end are mm-hmm. such strong set pieces. I mm-hmm. mean, you think about that first established side, you even see Dracula there, and it just slowly zooms in, and there's like fog looming and the catacombs there, mm-hmm. and again those stone archways. It it like like you say all the time, it's a mood. It's mm-hmm. a mood and it's a wonderful mood. But I feel like it also it it does the film does suffer setting wise, but it's also kind of do in part that that's what the novel is because you know dracula does you know inquire the help of a real estate agent to Mm -hmm. uh help sell his castle and get him moved over to london so Mm -hmm. i feel like um again it's one of those things that i'm like i understand why they don't stay at the castle and why it's not a big set piece but again it's just it kind the rest kind of suffers because the other settings they're Mm -hmm unremarkable like right. they're they're fine you believe and you understand where they and are it's but it's just of, especially in this peer portion of mm-hmm. film history they're still trying to figure out what makes cinema something beyond just a stage play you know mm-hmm. and you know i mean some of the earliest films that were actual narrative films and not just you know recording mm-hmm. a train going by or whatever was just people slapping a camera in front of a play and then they were like oh wait we could do this a little bit better and that's kind of the era we're in now or where they're just like oh we could do this a little bit better but it's still very theatrical Mm -hmm. it's like a camera sitting in front and you watch all the actors do their thing and then every once in a while it gives you the close-up shot of dracula's like face or whatever Mm -hmm. but we're not quite into like what modern cinema is yet in this period of time where it's like okay you know you're already taking creative liberties with the story of dracula maybe this conversation can happen while they're walking down the street in london you yes. know what i mean or while they're in a different place because that's the beauty of film is you can follow the characters from place to place you can have different angles you can mm-hmm. be in different settings constantly and be talking about the same thing you could talk about the same thing through a many transitions or whatever we haven't quite got that to that point in film history so they're just they're still sitting in a room doing exposition to each other but Mm -hmm. no i i think that's a definitely a good thing to take it to consideration there and obviously i'm sure another thing is the fact that whenever it came to making film they probably also wanted to make it cheap so they're like okay let's definitely only have like a few remote locations and so the fact that the abbey catacombs looks pretty much identical mm-hmm. to dracula's castles uh catacombs right there it's it's definitely understandable but at the same point it it, it does kind of take you out of it especially since you know there is a lot of exposition they do have to do in the film mm-hmm. there but even then they just kind of talk about like what they're going to do they're constantly saying well what are we going to do what are we going to do right and so that's the thing that kind of drives me a little bit crazy is the fact that, you know, Van Helsing is supposed to be, like, really smart and wise. 
And so whenever it comes to dealing with Dracula, I feel like he drops the ball way too many times. Yeah. <laughs> For someone that knows exactly what he's dealing with, he drops it too many times. Because that was the one thing, like, uh, they're like, oh, yeah, let us place the wolf's bane there. He will mm-hmm. not get across. But I'm pretty sure, like, and I could be misremembering it because I've seen it so many times. Doesn't Dracula just hypnotize somebody to remove it twice? Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. He does so... it multiple times. He just, like, looks at the maid through the door who's supposed to be, like, keeping watch or whatever and, like, mm-hmm. hypnotizes her to just remove it and open the door for mm-hmm. him. It's like, you think you would have fig- thought of that, you know what I mean? But... Yeah, well, and it's like, first time, Close sure. the blinds, you know? Yeah, and it's like, first time, sure, it could be an oversight. But to let it happen again, mm-hmm. it's like don't know how to feel about it um and yeah it definitely that it just kind of bothers me a little bit because i feel like there are some things that the film shows it clearly does like because one of the instances that van helsing confirms you mm-hmm. know that dracula is a vampire is that whenever um john is opening up the box to grab a cigarette there there's like a little mirror on the top latch right. part and so it doesn't show dracula's reflection there and so he shows it to john yeah, yeah. and john's like oh what the oh, heck there weird. and he still denies that he's a vampire right. even though he can't explain why which and, i, I and, and after he invites yeah. dracula over and then mm-hmm. like shows him the mirror point, point blank and then he like slaps it out of his hand he's like ah and then he's like, I just don't like mirrors. And then slinks away mm-hmm. and is like, you're, you are wiser than you seem, Dr. Elsing. Yeah. And, and still Jonathan's like, oh, it's normal behavior. Yeah, like, because that's the thing. Like, you could be, like, skeptical of it. Mm-hmm. But to, like, be denying so many things that just right in front of your face there, right. it just starts to get a little bit annoying there. I yeah. looked this up because mm-hmm. I was curious after you said, um, mm-hmm. like, like you know budget they're trying to turn a profit on this movie in the 30s mm-hmm. you know i was like i was like that's a good point they probably shot this in a really short schedule because that's how <laughs> they did things back in the day so i had to look up how long it took to shoot this movie the 36 days wow <laughs> where we spend yeah you spend years on movies now sometimes we'll do like a nine month shooting schedule mm-hmm. or something yeah now <laughs> they were like all right people are gonna go pay a nickel to watch this film let's <laughs> turn around in 36 days yeah, because um, it was the monster films um, that pretty much turned a big profit for Universal at the start there because mm-hmm. they were not doing very good. And so it was the monster films that really started kind of making money. But that is funny that they had such a short turnaround. Right. <laughs> like, okay, we have uh, we get have a little over a month to make a movie go there. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of like some of the things that does drive me a little bit crazy, which again, I'm sure if they have short production time you know mm-hmm. they're just like okay we just gotta yeah. push it along try not to overthink it just shoot and go right basically but it does kind of make the film suffer a little bit by making like people like john a little bit insufferable with how dubious he is right and i don't think that they're intentionally trying to make him dubious they're just trying to make him a little skeptical like well that's mm-hmm. mad talk yeah. people turning into bats and sucking blood i never <laughs> you know i would never yeah. Um, but it, it just does make it like, especially if you've seen it so many times that you're just like, okay, I have to listen to him right. doubt the film for the entire portion there. Uh, so there are like moments of him talking that does draw it away. But again, some of the golden moments is that opening sequence there with Renfield heading up to Dracula's castle oh, yeah. there. And then, um, by, that point to the point whenever the uh, police discover all the dead crewmates there in Renfield looking up the stairs, uh, which that's another thing I do have to applaud. I feel like the cinematography sometimes does nothing or it does everything Mm -hmm. there just to enhance the film there because they have some really good shots there. Um, Because one of the things I'll mention is uh, what actually made me think of it was Renfield, whenever he's laughing, going with that creepy laugh, going, mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then they cut to him and he's looking up the stairway and just has like a crazed look in his eye and the yeah. light shining down on him. That That's a really good shot there. Um, but other shots that are good is again, whenever Dracula is walking down his big, you know, stone staircase there. Mm-hmm. And I actually noticed this on the Blu-ray because it's higher quality, but they kept a spotlight on him as he was moving down the stairs just to make him 
more illuminated there mm -hmm. and i only saw it because they had like that little like round light on the back wall with this shadow mm -hmm. um but there's lots of good moments like that that just i can't get enough of that just screams like oh yeah this is dracula this yeah. is dracula here um and then it's just kind of sprinkled with stuff in the middle till you get to the end where again it kind of picks up the hype although i will say um and i know we'll talk about other stuff that happens in the middle <laughs> the ending is so just that's it <laughs> yeah it's kind of just like sudden it's like oh really like i thought there was gonna be more it the way it ends too where they yeah. just kind of follow him to his house that he bought the abbey you would have thought that's where the coffin was this whole time i'm not sure why it took them like five nights to be like <laughs> let's go here but yeah um they finally go there and he's just laying there and they drive the stake through his heart and that's okay he's dead forever mm -hmm. and i i was expecting him to like come back and they're like no it's just the end and i was like oh okay yeah and i think that's kind of like another good point there mm -hmm. that again kind of drives me a little nuts about this characterization of van helsing because he's super smart right he figures out immediately that dracula is a vampire and right. pretty much is able to connect two and two that he's the one attacking should know where he lives because Dracula's like, I live in an abbey. Please right. join me. Mm -hmm. You know, doing that. Shouldn't he just already haul it over and just be like, yep. I feel like Van Helsing's yeah. not even that smart and he just, it just happens to really like vampires and be in the right place <laughs> at the right time. And my, my theory on this is because he has just Wolfsbane on him like day one. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And he describes, they're like, what's that herb? And he's like, it's it's like Eastern European or whatever. And they're like, okay, so you got that. And then you brought it to London. Or like, you, you knew of a shop that had Wolfsbane? Or like, what? <laughs> like, how, why do you just have this, mm -hmm. Mr. Helsing? Um, yeah. I think he was, I think he was already... Yeah, I I, th I think he might be yeah. onto something. I think he enjoys the fact that he's saying a vampire because even the way he wields the cross, it's like a gun. Yeah, he holds onto it to the last minute. He's like waiting, you know, he's got his hand in his, his coat pocket and Dracula's lurching forward and he's like, what do you have there? Wolf's Bane? And he's, he goes to lurch at him and he's like, shut the worse. And then he pulls out the crucifix and, and Dracula's like, hey. Yeah. Uh, and then he just like he, like I know he doesn't do it, but in my mind he does like the gun twirl that cowboys yeah. do before putting it back in the holster. I was the phrase that was in my brain was definitely I always got that motherfucking thang on me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And then there's this whole plot point where, like, Jonathan was getting told by Mina, who was hypnotized, mm -hmm. to make sure that Van Helsing got rid of his crucifix. And he was like, why would I do that? And then and then he does take it from him. And I was like, oh, this is going to be something. And then it just they just kind of dropped that immediately. But, yeah, yeah. It. I'm glad they gave Mina a little bit more because after she's bitten by Dracula that she starts kind of becoming more hypnotized by dracula and mm -hmm. helping fulfill his duties there mm -hmm. uh because it allows her per to perform a little bit differently there yeah. like to like again have like those hypnotic eyes mm -hmm. that most of dracula's follower uh followers do uh but at the same point it just kind of ends up nowhere <laughs> kind of like with her friend lucy yeah did she just did she just die like in the middle is that the, what happened I didn't know. They, they didn't say what happened because she dies early at the the beginning of the film because mm -hmm. dracula sneaks into her window right. bites her neck and the doctors are like oh my god she's dead we tried giving up blood transfusion but she wouldn't take mm -hmm. she's dead and so then you know they take her to a cemetery then in the middle of the film you hear like these random children crying and this and you see lucy walking around in the dark mm -hmm. and then it's with uh the guard who's reading it says like you know two children were attacked by a beautiful woman yeah <laughs> there you never know what happens to Lucy. That's it. Yeah. And so that's just kind of one of the things that I'm like, Damn. okay. Doing the Lucy dirty. And so I, I, because they don't even, I don't think the main characters even know about Lucy doing that. Right. I don't, yeah. What's How would they like, not know? <laughs> where's she been? You know? I don't know. And that's the thing too. Like Dracula is able to get away with so much crap and have mm -hmm. zero repercussions. It's like how he kills that he kills an entire crew, right? which again, it's like, oh, it's a mystery, and oh, maybe it's Renfield. Sure. Right. Got it. And then he kills that random flower girl at the beginning of the film, mm -hmm. and again, no repercussions there. And it's not the fact that, you know, it's 
you know, Dracula is a powerful being there. So it's mm. not like I'm questioning stuff like, you know, well, who's stopping them? But usually, like, again, slasher mentality coming in. Usually they're oblivious to what's going on, but there's there's clearly been showings that, like, somebody's doing this. Right. Um, I don't know. I, I, again, it just kind of reads to, like, you figure vampire-loving Helsing would figure this stuff out. Right. Qu- quickly and connect the dots there, but again, he only focuses on the Mina situation and Dracula himself. Right, and he's really, you know, he, he's pretty sharp about putting together things that he didn't have evidence for otherwise. You know, he's like... He's a vampire, and vampires must sleep in their own soil. And then one of the other people correctly points out, they're like, okay, well, he's not in Transylvania anymore, so he can't be a vampire. And he's like, well, he must have brought soil over here then, and he's sleeping somewhere. And they're like, okay. And nobody's just like, let's go to the abbey he just bought. Yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah because I, I think... Let's he... go to his address. Because <laughs> that's, like, the interesting thing, because, like, Dracula goes to the opera just to kind of flex... Yeah, he was literally talking about it with this entire family that's getting haunted by him or whatever, that's getting traumatized by him. He was like, yeah, I bought an Abbey. And they're like, oh, you're going to have to fix it up. And he's like, I'm not really going to fix it up. (laughs) I like it because it reminds me of my old decrepit castle. And they're like, okay, cool. (laughs) Such a funny thing. Just a funny flex. And just nobody decides to bring that up Mm -hmm. later. Like, why don't you go there and figure out Mm -hmm. what he's doing during the middle of the day, at least? Yeah. If not, just stab him while you know, like, just, just, come on, guys. Yeah, definitely a lot of weird decisions the film made. And again, um, this also, uh, I, I mentioned this earlier, but to dive more into detail, like the scene with Renfield, whenever one of the f- millions of times he escaped there, yeah. uh, whenever he um, scares that one maid to like falling over, and then he crawls over to her like an animal, which is mm-hmm. done like crazily. Like he does it so smooth and mm-hmm. animalistic there. Um but then he does nothing, I guess. He acts like he was gonna do something, but yeah, then he... she shows up in the next scene perfectly fine. Yeah, he like lurches forward to give her the old suck. And then of course they don't show that because they don't show anybody's neck getting slurped on and then yeah, she's just I don't think she ran out of maids or like <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they all look the same or what? <laughs> yeah def- definitely weird choices and then there's lots of times where i think dracula could have kidnapped uh, mina early <laughs> on oh, but then yeah. doesn't and like i chalk yeah. that up to him being like an eccentric like oh i'm gonna like hypnotize her and make her do things to jonathan you are banging my daughter you know? <laughs> um <laughs> quality meme (laughs) but uh you know so i'm like sure whatever but like the highly rational people there and the people that are trying to protect their daughters and the people that should be angry at this vampire guy that's attacking their family Mm. i just yeah i I question their motivations a lot yeah yeah which again kind of it definitely does hurt the film a little bit there because you're like okay this doesn't make too much Mm -hmm. sense and again that's not the point of the film there because some films are like oh yeah that's the point of the film um but yeah um despite all that it still allows some good moments to happen again another moment i have to talk about is again would have been cool to kind of see it i'm sure it would have been impractical but because they do this a lot they talk about stuff they saw without actually showing right. the audience which is They're just not telling... the point of film <laughs> <But>. <laughs> yeah yeah um because but it does allow like some people to have good moments like because again renfield takes like this moment of like telling this story about like how dracula approached him mm-hmm. you know through the red mist and rats yeah rats. yeah that is a good mm-hmm. story he's like thousands of rats yeah how he gestured as if implying that the blood yeah. of all these rats would be his yeah, which again, like, you know, if you're going to tell, definitely kind of perform it, you know, mm-hmm. just to really, really sell it. Because again, the charisma that both uh, Renfield and Dracula have in this film makes it highly entertaining there, to say the least. Um, but yeah, and to talk about the ending of the film, just because I do want to dissect it, I feel like they do kind of rush it because it's like, okay. Dracula finally has taken Mina away and is going to take her as one of his brides, presumably. Again, you see Mm -hmm. he has brides at the beginning, even though you don't know who they are, and they don't even say... uh, 
anything. who they are. Yeah, yeah they. I, I think it's just one of those things. They're like, oh, there's these women that are around the castle there. Right. But yeah, we... just like the opening scene, mm-hmm. he like gets out of his coffin, and then all these women get out of their coffins too, mm-hmm. or whatever. Um, and they mentioned that he has brides, and yeah. So, but but yeah, he doesn't seem to take any of them to London. So he's he's getting some new ones, I guess. Mm hmm. Um. But yeah, with that ending there whenever he's like just hypnotizing Mina just to go down the staircase which uh again props props to the actress for stepping down steps without looking down Mm -hmm. there's no way I could do that without uh falling down the stairs but it does lead to a very awkward moment whenever Renfield happens to be running back to the abbey to meet up with Dracula and Renfield inadvertently uh shows uh john and van helsing where he's going Mm -hmm. so then whenever they say mina you know dracula's like what did you do and he's like no it wasn't me master please i didn't mean to lead them here because it's very weird about what his position is because he's not a hundred percent loyal to dracula it seems like he's sympathetic that he can't control what he does Mm -hmm. so you don't really know if he's with the good or the bad guys i feel he seems like he likes mina a lot like you know Mm -hmm. because he's he's mentioned you know like before dracula attacked her or whatever he said something about like um the consequences of, of, of punishing him or whatever he was like well then i can't do anything about that poor girl or whatever and he, mm-hmm. he talks about he talks about mina in a few different ways um and then i that seems to be like his motivation for mm-hmm. for like telling people little bits about dracula and, and confessing things but then every time he starts to you know the bat like floats down and it's dracula and he's like no master i wasn't saying things mm-hmm. And I do, I do think that makes him a much more complex character. That he's not mm-hmm. just one hundred percent on Team Dracula there, right? But he's struggling, and again, mm-hmm. he admits that he has a weak will. Mm-hmm. And so they even talk about, you know, say like, "Oh, you don't want to be punished in the afterlife for your misdoing." So he's like, "He won't punish me. He should know that the forces of evil are strong enough to overwhelm my weak mind." Mm. Uh, but I do like how he has moments where. He doesn't want to hurt Mina there because he's mm-hmm. like, no, please, no. And he just really has like a very somber, sad moment there as Dracula just continues to stare at him mm-hmm. through the lawn there. Uh, so then it leads to this penultimate moment of like, you don't know how. I, I think he's sorry that this whole mix up happened because, again, he wasn't trying to lure people to them, but at the same point, he didn't want Dracula to win. So he's on this thin wire. Right. There, so I think it makes it very interesting. I I will say though, his as much as I believe both actors try to make the most out of Renfield's death, it is yeah. definitely a little anticlimactic. I I do think it's like the first time mm-hmm. you really see Dracula actually attack someone, mm-hmm. which is cool because like yeah, he does he like goes in to bite people's necks and then they cut the picture, but. It's cool to see him like be pissed off instead of just yes. standing and staring because he's a scary guy and mm-hmm. they, they they put a lot of effort into making him look foreboding and stuff. But it's cool to see him like actually lash out mm-hmm. at, at him and, and throw him down the stairs. But... Well, and the thing that does make it more interesting is that Renfield's about to run away and Dracula's like, "No, stay." Yeah, he's, yeah, he could, like gives power word command or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you. <laughs> Yes, stay. stay, and then he just, I guess, strangles him and, like, stabs mm-hmm. him with his fingers, and then we cut to Renfield uh, doing his best, falling down the stairs, mm-hmm. and then dropping off to the side where I'm sure they had, like, a safety mat or something behind a set of boxes. So it it does kind of end up being comedic, because, again, it's just silent, and you just hear... <laughs> rolling down the stairs, slapstick style. Mm-hmm. Um, cause I feel like some scenes are done well and then other scenes are kind of, again, like that, a little goofy. Mm-hmm. Um, I just kind of wish a lot more of the nuance of like the start of the film was used throughout. Cause like one of the instances, um, I was just thinking about thinking about Renfield and Dracula is whenever Dracula is offering him food and he has a classic, you know, I never drink wine. Mm-hmm. Um, that whenever he cuts his finger and Dracula is like getting closer, the cross that the village, the villager gave Renfield earlier drops just coincidentally, and he lashes back. He's like, "Oh, nothing to be squeamish about. Just a little bit of blood." He mm-hmm. just doesn't think anything of it. Right there, so I definitely think they could have rewritten it a little bit better. But it's at the same point. 
I still enjoy a lot of it. But mm-hmm. the thing that does get a little goofy is what 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 exactly was Dracula's plan? You know, because right. he takes Mina, runs through the door, bars the door shut, and you know, John's like, "It's stuck. He's barred and shut." And then Van Helsing's like, "Okay, we'll get it open." And they get it open yeah. like a few seconds later, and. Dracula's already in his coffin, which you can argue he has to go in his coffin Mm because, like, the sunrise and everything. But it's just the way it's written up there. It's like, was Dracula just hoping, I pray the door holds over the day. Yeah. (laughs) Or like, oh, boy, I hope they don't find me where I took this woman, regardless of if they followed my little slave or not. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, exactly. And so it does kind of make it a little bit tricky whenever it comes to, like, killing him with a stake through the heart there because i feel like the way they do it Mm -hmm. is like good it's just like whenever you have this intense moment of like there he goes you know they're having the chase and then it's just dracula in a coffin Mm -hmm. just lying there and again van helsey's like i will take care of this help me find something to drive the stake through this heart and so you don't see it because obviously they're not at the time going to show something that graphic right uh, go on there so then you just hear bella's cry of like oh oh <laughs> there um but again i feel like it's also fine but <laughs> van helsing's like you go on ahead i have things to do yeah <laughs> and then it just shows john and mina silently climbing up the staircase no grand music to close out Mm -hmm. and then it just fades to black and then shows the end it's a universal picture yeah with a period yeah it's a universal picture period (laughs) uh so it does kind of again you're getting to the climax like the drive of like oh there it is they're finally Mm going to take out dracula and it's just like okay they got him because i i mean again to draw comparisons to nosferatu i felt like it had more of a bigger climax there because again You know, knows for like yeah. more powerful even. Mm-hmm. Just yeah, yeah. Um, definitely did a lot more crazy stuff. But again, like whenever you see him hit by the sunlight, there mm-hmm. it like fades away there, and there's just a lot more impact. You know, because uh, they die at the end of the film. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, mm-hmm. I do feel like, especially for monster movies like something like Dracula, where he has a layer. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of the you know a lot of the common storytelling technique is that you 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 kind of at the end at the climax you're like entering hell you're entering their dungeon and Mm. it's like a descent and it's part of the journey and that's what makes it interesting it's like you step into this place and you're like oh now i'm in the evil place and i have to face the evil Mm -hmm. or whatever but we just don't really get that so much as we get like a little taste of it in the beginning It it does it so much better in the beginning entering dracula's actual castle you know and and you know obviously the the hero the protagonist there in that first little arc is unsuccessful because uh, he turns into his little dracula's little slave yeah and they go to london but then the second instance when you go into the 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 decrepit abbey that dracula sleeps in the bottom of yeah it's really as simple as you know opening the door that he barred and then (laughs) and then killing him like it's not I wish there was more of a descent into the dungeon. Yes. You know, um, that could have really hit this home. But I yeah. feel like they were just trying to wrap it up after like 30 minutes of exposition in the mental ward. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that definitely ha- plays into it because they're just like, okay, how do we wrap up this film? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, he goes to sleep and they drive a stake through his heart at the end. Right. You know, so again, it's like, it's not bad. It's just, you know whenever you're comparing it to what they could have possibly done even mm-hmm. at that time there so because it's not a limitation of their technology at the time right. it's just the way that it was written it's pretty uh, doing that but yeah overall it's still a fine ending yeah. i didn't feel like you know oh well that sucked there it's just kind of like okay no it's definitely like the ending i wanted it just yeah it wasn't executed mm-hmm. quite the way that i yeah feel like it could have been hammered home but and again you get the resolution that like oh mina is saved from dracula's clutches but mm-hmm. then you don't know what happens to all of dracula's brides um or lucy right there are a lot of loose ends that they just kind of like leave <laughs> you know you know and it's not one of those like well it's for the audience's interpretation it's like no they just kind of like yeah <laughs> didn't close that loop you know yeah yeah they just kind of forgot that was a bullet point there like they wanted to add something to it but they're like nah 
No, let's just save it for the extended right. cut that will never come out. <laughs> the Schneider cut. Yeah. <laughs> Um, was there any other points you wanted to hit on Dracula before wrapping this bad boy up? Boy, I don't think so. Um, the only point I want to bring up, because again, I just love that first shot and we alluded it to it at the beginning, but whenever Dracula is walking down the staircase, there's like that big cobweb there mm -hmm. and he gets in front of it somehow, but you know how he does it on a technical merit is the fact they probably just had Bella walking behind the web, right. then cut to him like, you know moving to the front of the web so that way he doesn't cut through it but i do love that whenever he's walking back up the staircase you know cuts to renfield who then has like a bewildered look in his eye as mm -hmm. you know as we imagine he, dracula just passed through the cobweb without disturbing it any right. and so then whenever he walks up he has the cane you know and he just pfft, moves through and then bella has that cheeky comment about you know spiders weaving their web for the flies mm -hmm. there um so I, I think that's fun. I also think it's fun that Dracula has it to where Renfield only craves small creatures like flies, spiders, and rats. I love that character choice for him. He's like a lesser vampire. But yes. It, it, but it makes him, yeah, kind of like an awkward servant, but also just like his big dream that he that he describes that he was tempted with from, from Dracula with is, yeah, just a thousand rats. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> I, I mean, mm. I just love that in the character because mm. he is sort of like, you know, it makes him a little more harmless than Dracula, but still um, just macabre and like mm. and, and creepy and foreboding. But yeah, no, I, I would definitely agree. And so, again, moral of the story, uh, Renfield, true MVP yeah. of the film Dracula. Definitely the, the, the most developed and interesting and nuanced character on the screen the whole time. But. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um but yeah, I, I think that wraps it up for the film Dracula. And so now Dracula, Dracula has Ugh. returned to his coffin. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yes, he's really staked out a new place in London. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so why don't we talk about the next film we're going to be watching on the podcast. So staying true to the overall theme of this episode we're going to be keeping the same theme and visiting another member of universal's monster family oh. and so um i think you might have a pretty good guess as to what it might be um frankenstein yes that's it <laughs> I, I, I was like you I'm not even going to tease. You know, like, already, like, I have these two Dude, Universal yeah. films. That definitely was a good, strong hint. Yeah, yeah. I was just like, I'm just, you know what? Let's see what you go with as little as I'm giving you here. So, yes. Uh, next episode will be Frankenstein. So, thank you all so much for listening to this episode of Poppin' the Scary. And we'll see y'all again next time when we're Poppin' the Scary with... Frankenstein. It's actually Frankenstein's monster. Um, <laughs> <laughs> actually, 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 actually. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube, Castbox, or iTunes platforms to stay up to date when new episodes drop. To see what Aaron and I are up to, check out our respective Twitter accounts. For me, it is at Colkirk VA, and for Aaron, it is at Animal Game Dev. Thank you all so much for listening to our podcast. We'll speak to you all again next time when we're popping the scary.